Um, Office of Cuba Broadcasting Director Carlos Garcia Perez will now give an overview of OCB activities. Um, I, I would also like to say I've gotten a chance to know Carlos very well since I started. I've been down here a number of times uh, in my day job, and Carlos is always gracious enough to have a cup of coffee or do whatever Cuban coffee. Um, and I've been quite impressed with the operation down here. I think they, they a lot of good people doing a lot of really good work uh, down here for for Cuba, and excited to hear more about it today. So, Carlos, go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sorry about the little phone issues, but this is actually what we deal with every day with Cuba. So I guess we're practicing a little bit, so we don't lose the uh, uh, the issues that we face here. But I want to welcome the board. I want to welcome more our distinguished guests and. Um, uh, visitors that are here today. It's a great honor and privilege to have you here. Very proud of this institution. So um, again, welcome. I want to emphasize that we don't like to call this a presentation, but more like a conversation. So we can talk, we can interrupt, ask questions in the middle of, of, the, present, of the conversation uh, to make it more informal and informative to all of you. So here at the Martis, we frequently talk about two Cubas. And what follows are just examples of what we mean. And please remember, there are many more, so these are just a few. One Cuba is the one that commercial news operations try to cover, but there's only so much that they can do because of the restrictions to the freedom of press. So often, the coverage focuses on the Cuban government's leaders' actions or inactions. Because of the long history between the U.S. and Cuba, anything that may remotely affect U.S.-Cuba relations will grab headline, headlines. You may also see a headline that reads, for example, the Cuban government repression has increased because of their X number of arrests last month. And then there's the other Cuba, still under the same dictatorship and repressive regime, but the headline might read as follows. The government repression has increased because more people are out on the street demanding respect for their most basic human rights. Or because, like in the case of small business owners, they are demanding certain obligations from the government. You also see citizen on, citizens on the island pushing the Cuban government and pushing, pushing hard for their political and economic independence. It was big news when the government allowed certain services to go private. Yet, there has been a black market in Cuba for decades. The other Cuba also shows a Cuban youth yearning for technology and using the technology to communicate and obtain information. And also, you see a very apolitical society with the human rights activists playing an important role, but the majority of the population not relating back to the human rights violations to their daily day struggles. So today's conversation will provide an understanding of the real Cuba through the work of the Martis. So to start the conversation, we're going to roll or actually play a DVD um, to start the conversation going. So if we can roll the tape or play the DVD. It's a new day in Cuba, and at the Martis. Muy buenos días, es momento de comenzar esta tu revista tempranito y de mañana, la portada informativa de Radio Martí. Mándamelo de human trafficking. Una entrevista de, de Karen con San Diego, que le entregaron un teléfono clandestino. Yo he visto la nota de, de la voto. ¿La viste ayer? Y el hombre explica cómo los Estados Unidos tuvieron un rol importantísimo a la hora de poner a Fidel Castro. No, 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 no,
Y tenemos también muchos proyectos sobre el alcoholismo, sobre todo en la sociedad joven. El hombre cubano, el único refugio para poder desaparecer de la de la, de la guerra es el alcohol. Es el alcohol. Sí, pero el alcohol. la mujer entonces sí. no se puede convertir. Vamos a comparar la sociedad cubana a la República. Del 80 a la actualidad. Ha habido una creciente incidencia de robos en casa y en bodega. Por años se ha dicho que el capitalismo es malo. Realmente un capitalismo en Cuba va a ser brutal porque la gente no está preparada para ese cambio. Plancha de pelo babyliss, temperatura de 450 grados para el El mejor precio, los interesados pueden llamar a 5, 4, 31, 37, 63. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo están? College students from Cuba have come to express their hopes for the future. Vamos a enseñarle el mapa con todos los, los sitios de... Where's the video from Cuba? Hola, muy buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a Antena Live. Desde la cárcel en La Habana, en la que se encuentra confinado arbitrariamente, el escritor disidente cubano Ángel Santi Esteban conversó en exclusiva con Televisión Martín. He conocido a Isla Completa. He conocido a muchas personas, desde jóvenes hasta niños, ancianos. Y es bueno cuando tú te vas a un pueblo que no conoces, encuentras a un joven y te das cuenta que este joven tiene una, un matiz contestatario. Radio Martí es la emisora que vengo yendo desde que era chiquito cuando había un radio en mi casa, ya tan roto, y era la emisora que, que me dio una idea de cuán realmente complejo, cuán realmente desagradable era la situación en mi país. ¿Qué enviaste? Una nota sobre la cantidad de abortos que, que se han registrado en Cuba durante este primer año y que ha sido la cifra más alta desde el año 1994 cuando la crisis de la en solamente minutos ya vamos a estar conversando tanto con Michelle como con Giovanni Sánchez en La Habana. Gracias por todo y dentro de 30 minutos estamos llamando ya. Gracias. I'm Lisandra Díaz Blanco. No, I'm Lisandra Díaz Blanco. You are Juan Juan Almeida. We are the host of the radio show 1800 Online. Our show is like a cyber cafe. We well, welcome to our studios to bloggers, artists, athletes, business persons, and anything to do with the internet. We are fun, irreverent, but respectful. No, mierda. Respectful. 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 No es como un Twitter o como un Facebook. Querés enviar a un grupo de personas un SMS. Lo envías a través de tu teléfono, pero con el costo de un CUC. Entonces, Lipio, estos son eh, los duplicadores que utilizamos para sacar las copias que les enviamos a ustedes para La Habana para que ustedes después puedan distribuir todas las cantidades que necesitan. DVDs and flash drives of Martí content are being distributed in Cuba. ¿Qué tal amigos? Pónganse cómodos y bienvenidos a su noticiero 100% deportivo al duro y sin guantes. Vamos a pedirle a Everett Semanat que nos ponga la musiquita de Put Me In Coach. Recuerden que el deporte rompe todas las barreras. Generating more content from Cuba, Latin America and around the world for the people of Cuba with the latest tools and technologies. Rewriting the traditional rules of broadcasting. We are Martí. Somos Martí. Oscar Rodriguez and this is Natalia Cruzeiras. Buenos días. 
Before we begin, I just wanted to reiterate what Carlos said earlier. Uh, the culture we have here at OCB is about engagement, it's about interaction, and it's uh, about having a good conversation with the people in Cuba, but also in the building, and with you today. So please, at any moment, feel free to interact uh, with us, ask us questions. Um, a second ago, you just saw the two Cubas. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the two Martis. There's a lot of myths out there about the Martis. You hear that TV Marti can't be seen, that radio Marti can't be heard, and that there's a lot of fear, so people won't talk to us, so we don't have that engagement with our audience. So I want to let Natalia talk a little bit more about some of these points. So let's start with the first one, the myths. Um, and the first one is that no one watches TV Marti, and every time someone tells me, when I say that I work for the Martis, that no one watches TV Marti, and they talk to me about the plane of the Belen, because they still bring that up, I realize how little they know about our operation. And like any other media, we focus on where our audience is and how they consume media. And, and for that, I wanted to explain the three ways that people in Cuba consume media. One is for the local broadcast, which is a national uh, television owned and operated entirely by the government. It's heavily politicized, um, very poor quality. And over the dozens of surveys that we have done, people are tired of these programming. They don't watch. The second way they, they watch television um, is through direct-to-home satellite cable systems. There are hundreds and hundreds of these pirate neighborhoods because they're forbidden on the island. Um, and we air there every day. We're looking for more avenues and more channels, more hours of that. But this, again, is only available in urban cities and is um, cost prohibited because you have to buy the, the programs and pay for them um, overseas. And the way that the majority of Cubans consume med media nowadays is through um, channels of DVD, and, and hard drives that we saw in the previous video how we're distributing the Marti content. And through that channel, we're sending thousands and thousands of DVDs each week, and we're crossing the whole island entirely. We have duplication centers, distribution centers, and the key part of this is that all the volunteers that help us distribute this content are not only political activists, volunteers, um, journalists, or bloggers, are also regular members of the civil society and more than a hundred churches of different denominations. So this is part of the, the hunger, the interest of making our content available across the island. And through this, um, the, the last way that we're distributing the content is also via FTP, since there's starting to be more access to the, to the web and downloading. Um, we want to make sure that our content is available the same day as it airs. So we have located two centers in Havana and Santiago where people can download our primetime newscasts and other programming, and we're expanding that hopefully by at least five more centers by the end of the year. And through these different channels, we're not only sending TV Matic content, but also Radio Marti content. And that means us to talk about our next myth, which is that Radio Marti is jammed. Radio Marti is jammed. Can't hear it in Cuba. That is a common myth. I've been hearing that for 30 years. Um, and it's true, the Cuban government goes through great efforts to jam our signal. The problem is, it's a big country, and there's a lot of people trying to listen to the station. So as you get outside of Havana, even in Havana, depending on where you're located, if you're hired in certain areas where the jammers are, as you get out into the rural areas, there's a lot of people listening. But how do you know that? This is just me saying this, right? Well, we've done a lot of work to engage our audience. Every day, we're getting SMS texts, emails. We're getting a lot of the new tools in work, in process now, where we're getting feedback from them on a daily basis. And that's how we know they're listening. Another vehicle we've used is contests. Uh, just recently, we had a contest. Uh, it was last year, the World Series. It was just a couple of days, not a very long contest at all. We had over 500 people that uh, entered the contest. A lot of them did it through SMS texts, uh, in emails. And as you can see here, these emails that were coming to us, they're not coming to us from Yahoo or Gmail. They're coming to us from government accounts at the Ministry of Education, Health. And so people are, 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 are using these accounts to talk to us. But that brings up the next point, um, which is the, the MBA. This is the most recent example. We broadcast the MBA just last week, the finals. Um, and we did a great job doing that, but the Cuban government apparently was concerned. They turned around and rebroadcast, pirated the NBA Finals. Uh, this is a picture from Cuba of the NBA Finals being broadcast. They actually went on their national website and put it in the programming. The NBA wasn't too happy about it. Um, but there are other examples of that. We put a lot of information out, in this case, sports. 
and the people in Cuba are listening to that information. They're writing down the statistics. This is an example of an email blast on the intranet inside of Cuba that's going out to uh, the people on the island. Uh, this was so popular that the Cuban government, within about two weeks, put out a new uh, sports program, something they hadn't done in about 10 years. So um, they're, they're, they're listening. They're watching to see what we're doing. Um, it's not just sports, though. It's a lot of other things and a lot of people taking risks to participate in our program. They're going to great lengths. Uh, we're going to listen to a clip now um, from Rafael Samuel. This gentleman uh, went all the way to the point of listening to Radio Marti while he was in jail. He was able to smuggle a radio. Let's listen to that. Gracias a un compañero en la cárcel de Guanajay que se inventó una radio de galera, pude escuchar las primeras emisiones de Radio Martín desde la prisión, desde la cárcel. Por primera vez los que no teníamos voz alcanzamos o llegamos a tener una voz amplificada hacia toda la República. Viva Radio Martín. More recently, with the new travel that's going on through the visas, Yoani Sanchez was able to travel for the first time under that program. Uh, she came to OCB. She told us the importance of our transmissions. And let's listen to that. Con muchas personas de pueblo, de provincia, de pequeños eh, locaciones, de pequeños caseríos prácticamente perdidos en la nada, para los que ustedes son la única fuente de información paralela a la información gubernamental. Así que se los agradezco en nombre de ellos. Eh, no, para nada, vuestra boca en el vacío, para nada. All of these examples you're seeing here lead us to the third myth. People are afraid to talk, so we're not getting the engagement. Um, the people are losing that fear more and more. An example, just at the beginning of this school year in Cuba, we had a program talking about the, how the school was going to start, and teachers from the island started calling in. They were concerned about supplies for their students. And so they started calling in. There was a bit of a web, a, a, a network that was created there live on the show of people talking about, you know, their concerns and how to help each other get uh, supplies. Uh, another example was what you call a city council member uh, in an area in Cuba where she was so frustrated with the system uh, in trying to uh, be concerned with the closures that were taking place in rural, of rural schools in, in Cuba. She wasn't getting any results, so she turned to Las Noticias Como Son, a radio program here, called in, and that ended up getting results. Um, so there's, those are a couple of examples, um, but again, there, all the other examples are the SMS. Pyramideo, all of these other new uh, media tools that we're using to get through. And part of the point that we wanted to make here is that uh, people come to us because we break the stories that the Cuban government won't cover. Uh, we tell the stories that are, that are not available otherwise. And at the end of the day, we produce content that puts the Cuban government in a position to defend themselves. And here's an example. When, when the cholera outbreak started last year, we started reporting on it um, and, and provide information on how to prevent the illness a month before the Cuban government even acknowledged there was a problem. Same thing happened with the dengue, which eventually became one of the most uh, complicated epidemics in Cienfuegos. And just recently with the, uh, this virus that is so hard for me to pronounce, the chikungunya virus in the Caribbean, that has infected more than 300,000 people and already killed 28 people in the Caribbean. We've been reporting on that for almost two months, and the Cuban government only this week recognize that there was a problem and, and recognize of three, six cases. So um, we are telling these stories, they're listening and they're responding. There was this example in Radio Marti program, Cuba al Dia, that reported through independent journalists that there were cases of smuggling of endangered domestic birds. And it was not until that that the next day, Grandma, the national newspaper, reported on it. Similar thing happened with a report that we did about um, the, the impunity in which there was a massive killing of sea turtles. Next day, the regional newspaper, Sierra Maestra, published this article about um, the praises that the World Life Wildlife Fund was giving the Cuban government for their treatment of the turtles. However, the Martis were able to secure this video that runs for five, about five minutes, sh just showing the shells of the turtles um, in the area. So the point is, as you can see, a trend, right? We report of it, we, make the, 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 we discover the uncomfortable stories, 
Cuban government has to acknowledge and respond to it. Um, and that is a constant. That doesn't change. You know, these examples, you may not always see the footstep, but we frequently see the footprint left behind. Uh, so these are examples of, of that. Um, however, uh, can, can we roll the, the video, Natalia? Um, the <laughs> oppression is an everyday thing here. People trying to get out and get the word out are getting beat up, and there's so many examples of this happening. Uh, the Cuban government controls all the media. They control all of the, uh, the intranet, intranet inside the island, and they make sure that alternative sources of news and information don't reach the people. Uh, so that, that is the, the, the main purpose of, of you seeing that. It's the most isolated country in the Western Hemisphere. And one way that they keep this isolation, not only by owning the means of, of communication, is by limiting and making it really cost restrictive. So we've seen an increase of usage of cell phones uh, exponentially. Now we have more than 2 million users of cell phones in Cuba, more than landlines. Um, however, the cost of the cell phone technology is outside of the capacity of regular Cubans. To give you an example, just to send one megabyte, like simple picture from your cell phone, it will cost you the equivalent of $1 when you make around the regular Cuban will make $20 a month. The other way to control this is through the access to the internet. As you know, it's restrictive, it's censored. 5% of the population in Cuba uh, has access to it. But again, it's, it's also very expensive. Accessing your email, you have to pay $2.50. To navigate the internet, which is not internet, it's internet controlled by the government, $4.50 an hour. Um, and it's really ab above the means of the regular Cuban people. However, Cubans are very creative. And we've seen a huge increase uh, and proliferation of Wi-Fi networks, illegal antennas, and they access the web. And we've been putting a lot of um, efforts in revamping our web content and producing original content that is starting to show good progress. In the last three years, we've seen our daily unique visitors grow more than 480%. The five first months of this month, if we continue the trend, we're going to, again, be breaking the traffic to our site with this um, original content. And of course, because our site recovers all the stories that we cover on TV and radio and the original content for the website, the Cuban government blocks it, so we provide proxy sites that circumvent these blockages so people can go online. And this is a, an example of a student in Cuba watching our, our um, our story. Is that traffic coming from outside the, the Cuba or inside the Cuba? It's a mix. So through, through the proxy sites, we can know how many people logged in in Cuba for the ones that we host. There are many others that we don't host that people can access to, and I cannot give accurate data, but the ones that we host, we can. Yeah. Um, and through the web is not the only way that we connect. We also connect with them via targeted cell phones and emails um, that we send at least for one million uh, um, a month. And this is the important part of it is that it's not only that we're pushing content, but it's a two-way communication, particularly with the SMS. Given all the limitations that you've just seen, SMS texting is very popular. Uh, we've uh, received over 3,000 SMS texts since 2012 from Cuba. Most of that information we've been able to use inside of news and information programming on the station. But it's not just the news and information, it's also what we're doing to empower the people <laughs> on the island. Piramideo is a tool, is a social media tool that was created in order for them to be able to converse, to share information, and to provide uh, each other with new sources of, of whatever they wanted to use it for. Uh, recently, um, the people are losing the fear. So when you saw the recent news on Sun Suneo, um, you know, that, that caused uh, a jump in, in the subscribers to Piramideo to what is now um, almost 12,000 users. Um, so we're, losing, we're, we're, we're looking into these new technologies and finding new ways to deliver our content, like paper flash drives that are easy to smuggle, hard to detect. And if people are connected to the website uh, or have access to online, we can also track their, their, their activities. And same thing happens with, with social media. Um, we revamped our efforts in social media. We're broad from 1% to 18% of traffic now comes from social media. Facebook, extremely popular on the island. And we've seen such a popularity of it that we decided to uh, launch this project called Reporta Cuba. We started with probably 30 citizen journalists across the island. We launched this one month ago. Now we have more than 60 citizen journalists that they send us 
pictures, video, everything via SMS, email, and all the means of communication. And this is one of the efforts that we're trying to do to build up from the very basic technical capacities available on the island mixed with the new technology that we can provide. Uh, we're looking into, besides the Marti app that we currently have, developing apps with teams of coders that are based in Havana um, that could bring uh, useful tools on an everyday basis. And basically this is trying to bring the analog and digital world together because that's how it functions on the island. Let's step back a second uh, and look at how the transition is starting to take place between traditional broadcast vehicles and the new media. Radiogram. That, that, that it is. I'm sorry, I jumped in. <laughs> Radiogram is a tool we're starting to use now. This is a signal that is sent out over shortwave. It's a digital signal that, when received on a computer, turns into text. And that is how we're going to get the newscasts into the island, which they can then share through Bluetooth or simply print them out and share them that way. Um, and uh, so that's, that's in, the progress, in progress now. But also, we're looking at developing a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week satellite network for Cuba, uh, radio, using some of the radio digital uh, satellite transmission uh, possibilities that we have there. Uh, and we're also actively uh, pursuing broadening the internet access on the island. Well, all of these new technologies are fantastic, but if we don't have serious content that we are conceiving originally to work across our platforms, and um, we wouldn't have anything. So to talk about content and how we choose this content, explain to you a little bit more about pro the process of selecting the stories that we cover, we're going to call Humberto Castillo to give you a little bit more about that. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you. Well, b before this meeting, we decided that, uh, that I would talk to you in Spanish because it's a way to show you how diverse and multicultural we are in the Martis. But the real reason behind this is that I don't want to provoke brain damage in <laughs> any one of you. So Entonces, eh, realmente, yo quiero que eh, darle un poquito de perspectiva histórica a, a esto que han, esta presentación que les quedó muy bien a Natalia y a Oscar, de cómo se hacen los Martí, cómo transmitimos nuestra información. Eh, hay que pensar, vamos a partir de un, de un punto histórico y concreto, con cifras, que se trata de que la Cuba, en 1959, antes de Castro, contaba con 26 periódicos, más de 80 estaciones de radio y tres canales de televisión privados. En menos de dos años eso formó parte de la historia. Por tanto, la creación de Radio Martí en 1985, en plena Guerra Fría, significó un cambio radical para la sociedad atrapada en Cuba, la sociedad censurada, desinformada, de que el gobierno controlaba los únicos medios supervivientes de comunicación. En 1965 la cosa se convierte en algo más férreo y más absolutamente controlado con la fundación del diario Granma, que es el órgano oficial del Partido Comunista de Cuba y que se convirtió desde ese momento en el rector de lo que se informaba al pueblo cubano. Por tanto, Cuba en 1965 ya era un verdadero sepulcro de la libertad de expresión. Al nacimiento de Radio Martí se abren las puertas para, de la información para los cubanos, con sus dificultades, con sus limitaciones de, eh, de, de poder sintonizar o no la emisora, pero nos convertimos, como dijo Saumel desde la cárcel, en la voz de los que no tenían voz y en la información en general de lo que sucedía en el mundo y de lo que sucedía dentro de la isla. Ejemplo de ello, a grosso modo puedo mencionar que Radio Martí fue por donde primero se le dijo al pueblo cubano cuando se libraba la guerra africana en Angola, Radio Martí reportaba las víctimas que tenía el ejército cubano, las bajas que tenía el ejército cubano, las posiciones técnicas, todo lo que la prensa oficial dejaba de decir. También en esa misma época surge desafortunadamente la plaga mundial del virus del SIDA, en Cuba, como en todas partes del mundo, 
hubo sida también, pero no se sabía, no se sabía dentro de la isla y no se sabía en el mundo. Radio Martí reveló con unos reportajes muy completos la existencia del virus en la isla, la segregación que sufrían los pacientes, las personas infectadas con el virus en un sanatorio llamado Los Cocos, que fue un escándalo mundialmente que, que, que estas personas vivieran como presos por padecer la enfermedad y además enterarse a los cubanos de que se podían contagiar con esta enfermedad. Igualmente también ha sido plataforma Radio Martí de información cada vez que ha habido una deserción, no solo de figuras importantes del gobierno, pero también deportistas, ciudadanos, eh, comunes, artistas, y entonces nosotros fuimos el vehículo para que ellos se enteraran. Y con muchísimo orgullo puedo decir esto hoy porque yo vengo del mundo corporativo, antes de trabajar aquí trabajé en periódicos del área comercial, específicamente en el Nuevo Herald, periódico que dirigí durante 10 años y fui fiscalizador de esta casa, fiscalizador en el sentido de cómo se usaban los dineros públicos, de cómo se usaban los dineros de los ciudadanos, de cómo se informaba al pueblo cubano, qué tipo de periodismo se hacía aquí. Y formar parte de esta casa hoy, lo digo con emoción, eh, me llena de orgullo por el periodismo de excelencia que siempre se hizo, por el periodismo de excelencia que se hace hoy. Y más que todo, por la responsabilidad que tenemos hoy en día, que por primera vez en los últimos dos años tenemos periodistas en Cuba, periodistas que funcionan y cobran y le pagamos gracias a una especial eh, licencia de OFAC, le pagamos y contratamos periodistas dentro de la isla y transmitimos estos valores de excelencia periodística. Ellos tenían su formación, pero nosotros lo llevamos al periodismo que se hace en el mundo, al periodismo que se hace en los Estados Unidos, al periodismo balanceado, al periodismo de doble fuente. Eh, en esta casa hemos introducido como una meta que ya es absolutamente común cuando nosotros hacemos un reportaje, buscamos la respuesta del gobierno cubano. Si vamos a hablar de las enfermedades, llamamos a los hospitales. Si vamos a hablar de la educación, nos comunicamos con el Ministerio de Educación, con escuelas, con maestros, no disidentes, con la oficialidad. Hacemos un trabajo de periodismo dentro de la isla exactamente igual y con los mismos estándares que los hacemos en los Estados Unidos. Y hay que pensar que esos colegas que trabajan allá, esos colegas trabajan en un ambiente absolutamente hostil, en un, absol en un ambiente donde peligra no solo el, el, su vida por ejercer la profesión, sufren el decomiso de sus instrumentos de trabajo, le quitan las cámaras, le quitan los teléfonos. Conseguir un teléfono celular en Cuba no es fácil, muchísimo menos una cámara, muchísimo menos un ordenador donde editar los materiales. Estos periodistas producen para nosotros materiales multimedia. Los hemos formado de esa manera. Algunos ya tenían algunos recursos. Le damos entrenamiento a través de las agencias que nos ayudan con, con la contratación de ellos para no pagarles directamente y digan que son eh, eh, periodistas pagados por el imperio, por el enemigo. Pues buscamos intermediarios, agencias que le, les paguen y les den entrenamiento. Igualmente... Eh, nuestro Buró Central de Información se comunica directamente con ellos, les hace las asignaciones y, por supuesto, la orientación de cómo debes por trabajarse los materiales de información para que sean verdaderamente eh, eh, creíbles y sean eh, válidos y sean respetuosos y puedan des ver, desbaratar esa, esa campaña nacional e internacional que ha hecho el gobierno de Cuba de desacreditar el trabajo de los mantí, de mellar nuestra credibilidad. Esas campañas se han hecho en foros, lógicamente, nacionales, todos los líderes cubanos critican, eh, líderes políticos critican nuestro trabajo, pero también lo hay en, en foros internacionales como las Naciones Unidas, como los países no alineados, como or eh, otras organizaciones latinoamericanas, particularmente en el hemisferio occidental, trabajan mucho contra nosotros. Pero con este trabajo verdaderamente de, de periodismo de excelencia es muy difícil que esa campaña de la gran llamada batalla de ideas que han hecho en los últimos años a través de la Internet, a través de las redes sociales, de desacreditar nuestro trabajo, realmente podemos probar lo contrario y ustedes lo han visto ahí. Hoy los Martí cuentan con una red de periodistas dentro de la isla 
que realmente es impactante. Son periodistas, más de dos docenas de periodistas que, como digo, trabajan y se les paga. Es decir, son, con, son empleados de, de los Martí, son nuestros stringers en, dentro de la isla. Y, y estos, estos periodistas abarcan todos los temas, todos los temas de la sociedad. Trabajamos los temas políticos con, con, con disidentes, con opositores que demuestran sus proyectos de trabajo. No nos interesa la politiquería, no nos interesa combatir al gobierno, nos interesa informar al pueblo específicamente de qué se hace, cómo se piensa dentro de la isla ciertos sectores y les proveemos esa información. Igualmente trabajamos en los renglones de la economía. Tanto la gubernamental, seguimos, fiscalizamos qué hace el gobierno, qué progresa, qué distribuye, qué no distribuye y reforzamos mucho la cobertura de la, de la naciente iniciativa privada dentro de la isla. Tenemos un programa, por ejemplo, que se hace periódicamente que es Avanza Cuba. Ese Avanza Cuba, ¿qué quiere decir? ¿De qué se trata ese programa? Es qué puedes hacer tú, tú cubano, dentro de la isla, al margen de lo que el gobierno te permita o no. ¿Qué puedes hacer por ti, por progresar, por ganar espacio, por mejorar tu vida? Ese es nuestro trabajo. De eso consiste en los Martí hoy en día. Eh, realmente creo que, que es importante que, que diga también que estos periodistas producen periódicamente un, una cantidad de material, generan contenido eh, tan abundante que es bastante difícil incluso el poder, a pesar del flujo de comunicación que tenemos con ellos a través de llamadas telefónicas continuas todos los días, muchas llamadas, textos, mensajes de textos telefónicos que funcionan muy bien y las redes sociales que permiten la inmediatez de la comunicación, eh, pero generan tanto contenido. Ahora tenemos un proyecto de producción radial dentro de la isla, que eso está off the record todavía, por favor, pero eh, lo estamos haciendo, ya estamos generando bastante contenido y en algún momento, en algún momento, las ondas de Radio Martí sonarán dentro y se emitirán desde dentro de la isla. Definitivamente, con este paquete que ustedes vieron antes presentado por Oscar y Natalia y cómo nosotros recogemos la información, no hay duda de que el trabajo de los Martí es esencial, fundamental, necesario, útil para la naciente sociedad civil en Cuba. Y... Por supuesto, tenemos impacto, pero del impacto siempre habla el jefe. Carlos García. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. So that's why I love this job. You know, we got great people working here. Um, since there have been any questions, I want to make an announcement that Governor Weinstein allowed me to say. He is my older brother. Everybody here is asking whether we're related or not. He is my older brother. So now that's out of the way, right? <laughs> we're we're going we're to find out the person who insulted you and flattered me by saying that yeah. we look alike. <laughs> it's an honor, sir. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about impact. Um, it's, it's been throughout the presentation. Um, the BBG Strategy Initiative has an impact model that has been developed by Rob's team. And, and there's a lot there, so I could be talking about that forever. I'm not going to do that to you. Um, But when we talk about impact and when we talk about change, it reminds me of a conversation that is a thought process that I had before I took this job coming from the commercial world, and then a conversation I subsequently had with Rob about it. And it was, what are, what are the taxpayers getting for here? I mean, what's, why, why? Why the Martis? Are, are we effective? I mean, this money, is it worth it? So. I have a, a short video to kind of summarize the, the impact model, and then we'll have a little discussion. But let's, let's go to the video, please. The Martis inform, engage, connect, and cause change in a very restrictive and government-controlled environment. One of our primary goals is to cause and provoke maximum interactivity with our audience through our content and reputation.
you. Let's talk a little bit about change. In that, in that model, in that, it talks about influence people. So are we influencing people in Cuba? And like Humberto said, we're not get, we don't get into the politics of it. We actually do our journalist job. We're journalists here. So we try to provide balance and objective. We don't try. We provide balance and objective information to the people in Cuba. Go ahead, sir. Can I ask just a question about Please. that? So, so what is the... Talk for a couple minutes or a couple seconds about the general knowledge on the island of the people there of what's really going on. So, for example, when when um, you know when uh, the the leader of Venezuela was there, apparently getting medical you know medical care or whatever. How much is is the? I know it's not a free media environment, but is it the word on the street? Do people know what's going on, or do people not know what's going on in Cuba? I would. Um... I'm going to answer that by quoting something that um, Reynaldo Escobar told me yesterday, who's Giovanni Sanchez's husband. The way you find out about the things about Cuba 100 meters away from you is through Radio Marti. So when Chavez was taking, getting medical attention in Havana, there was some word of it, but it wasn't the full story. So Chavez is here, but the full story was not there. But you mentioned to me before, for example, that DirecTV is available for a lot of homes. They have dishes and DirecTV. If you have DirecTV, you're getting CNN, you're getting all this other stuff. So, so is, there, is that a general widespread thing, or is it very, very limited? That's concentrated in Havana. Okay. And that's a very good question, Mr. Chairman, because Havana, it's a totally different deal than outside Havana, right? So you have the satellite dishes that we show you here in Havana, but for example, He's not here now, but Mendez Castillo, who was last night in the dinner, will tell you that out, outside Havana, people find out about what's going on through, radio, through the radio waves, because there's just no access to media. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Sorry to interrupt, but I, no, I think no, please, what, you're, what you're talking about right now is exactly the key of all these things, which is, are, we, are what we're doing, is it cost effective and is it really having an impact? So. Totally. Keep going. Totally. Thank you. Um, so, so we start with that. The other way that we influence people is through interactivity. And Natalia and Oscar talk about that, right? I mean, we don't use radio the way people used to use radio. Our radio, our radio um, platform, we <coughs> use to provide information that's otherwise not available to the people in Cuba that's available on the Internet. And our shows are interactive, and you have to have a foot on the ground to have a show at the Martis. We got a lot of proposals for shows on the Martis. You know, I want to do this show, I want to do that show. If you don't have contacts in the island, if you are not going to have participation from people on the island, you're not going on the, on the airwaves. Um, and the third part of the influence people, which is important, and it goes a little bit to your question, is we, try, we are trying to insert, uh, insert the civil society of Cuba back into the Latin American scene. That's why Latin America is important to us, because Latin America has always been, I mean, Latin America is very strong now, right? So we try to use examples of what's going on in Latin America to the people in Cuba so they can better relate to what's going on in the region. So it's not only U.S., Cuba, it's, it's, it's you know, there's, there's more to it, right? We use the, the whole region to show what's going on on the island. And by the way, it's not only that we show, I mean, they participate, they talk to these experts, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, uh, Mr. Chairman, but today is a historical moment with that panel that you're going to present today. I think it's the first time going to, our, to what we do here, probably the first, day, the first time that we, in, in this institution, that a Cuban resident, somebody who lives in Cuba that we, that we care for very much, is going to be able to moderate a panel about Latin America. So it's a great opportunity. It's a great um, facil facilitation that we're doing here. So... Um, the second part of the change is do we influence the local media? You know, Miami and, and, and Havana are very close. You know, so when I read this, I'm not criticizing your model, Rob. I think it's great. I was like, okay, so what's the local media? The local media is the Cuban media, for sure. So are they reacting to what we're doing? And you saw great examples uh, by Natalia and Oscar. And the, the best one is the NBA. I had a conversation with, actually, I had a conversation with the commissioner of the NBA when they were down here, Adam Silver, about us. And he looked at me like I was just dropped from Mars, you know, and he was like, and I told him, you know what, commissioner, they're stealing your signal. 
And of course, there's money involved there. And how is that? Because we're broadcasting to Cuba, and they're using the ESPN in Spanish signal. And I told them, I know that's not a win for you. That's a huge win for us. So I think he was happy. <laughs> but um, it, it, it was just a great win for us. Same thing with Major League Baseball. When we first started doing Major League Baseball here, they would not rebroadcast Major League Baseball. They would just not do it. They now do it. It's a delay. It's all seven, seven day all games, nine all games. But, you know, it's, 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 it's creating change, right? It's forcing the local media. It's forcing the government to change. And that's part of the impact model. Um, last week, the report came out of a murder case uh, in the middle of the island. And Cuba reported on the case in a certain fashion, not as they always do, you know, kind of not in too many details. We went at it. We had great journalists here, like Humberto said. We only have great journalists in Cuba now, but we have great journalists. We always have great journalists here, but we're also benefiting from the travel restrictions because we're getting people that go back and forth to Cuba. So this gentleman started to make calls around the, the place where the murder took place. That piece created, and I, I, I couldn't find the email because he's, he's on vacation, but Humberto can vouch for this. We ran a piece in our website about this murder case. Grandma copied it word for word, with the exception of the last paragraph, where they identified the victims of that murder case, which is unheard of. They hardly ever do that. So that's, that's, that's impact, right? We're influenced them. Um, another one that's very close to my heart, and I'm going to use Mr. John Caulfield's um, outfit for this, is the chief of mission in Havana, who we have a great relationship with, respecting each other's jobs. It's, it's, it's been fabulous. I say it all the time. When, when the United States government changed the visa travel um, regulations, Tim Roach went to the Cuban government and asked, look, I'd like to do a public service announcement about this to inform the population. Well, he didn't get a response. So Tim, Tim's wife, Lynn, who we work very closely with, called us and said, would you do this? And we'll do it right now. We'll do it right now. So we did the PA. We did the public service announcement. Guess what happened? A week after that, they were calling Tim. Tim, would you like to, this is the Cuban government, would you like to call, would you like to come to us and explain this new visa travel restrictions or regulations? So that's impacting the local media. I don't want to about talk, talk about the Miami impact because, well, just a, I'm sorry. They published a two-page interview, uncensored, in Grandma, uh, with the public government of the United States. It's the first time any of us have ever seen anything like that. Thank you, John. Um, and the government, how, well, that's influencing the government because if you influence the media there, you influence the government. But I want to talk about other things that the government are doing very briefly. And I want to talk a little bit about Telesur. Is it, is it changing, though? I mean, it, you're, you're saying first time they've ever put an interview on, first time they've put the, the, the NBA is now on. Are things slowly starting to shift or, or not shift? Well, John, would you like to... Uh, uh, Can you have a question? Yeah, I think it was something Oscar said uh, earlier during his presentation about people losing fear. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering how that plays into Marti's uh, strategy uh, moving forward. It's uh, right in the middle of it. And that's part of our, that's our mantra, right? Our mantra is we, we get reactions from common citizens nowadays about news pieces. So we go to the government if the government is involved, but we also ask people, we have over 2 million uh, phones here, Cuban phones. So we asked regular citizens, what do you think about that? And they talk to us. Sometimes they hang up. Sometimes they talk. But our thing is we need to back the civil society providing news of information so that they can make educated decisions about their future. So we've seen that on our focus groups. We've done over 40 focus groups here of recent arrivals. And they will tell you that people are losing fear. But the government is also losing control. 
So it's it's a two-way street, right? So go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, and, I, and I'm wondering about some of the, pr the programming content, whether it's changed over the last few years, because there's obviously now this focus on uh, on markets, on economics, on trade and goods. Uh, it's not simply a there's one doesn't get a sense that there's much preaching about freedom or political issues. And I'm wondering whether you've changed programming at all in response to this uh, change in fear. And and lastly, what, if there was an increase in repression. How do you respond? Or are there plans in place? If there's an increase in repression? Yeah. Okay. So um, the, the first question is the change in programming. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, this institution is here because we know the situation in Cuba. Article 19, hum, you know, human rights, the Declaration of Human Rights, right? But we have to increase our audience. We just can't do it with the activists. We need to be able for the regular citizens to connect why is it that you're struggling? You're struggling because this is a problem with the government. So we need to make that connection. So that's why you see the change in content, because we need to attract more audience. I mean, the general population will help the activists create change. And the second question was, I'm sorry? No, I was asking about I asked about the, the, econ the, the focus now on economics and on, and on oh, markets, okay. and I saw a bit of that. I, I, yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah, that, yeah that, that's the third. That was the. Okay, yeah. so, so our message here is aspirational, inspirational, educational. People in Cuba know the situation that they live in. What they don't know is if somebody is running a successful small business down the block, we want them to find out. If somebody ge gets beat up by the government, we want to them find out. But the difference now is, Ken, like Umberto was saying, if somebody gets arrested and goes to, to the police station, that cop knows we're going to call, and they don't like that. They don't like that. Um, Antonio Rodiles, um, who's a very um, known activist, was arrested, I think it was six months ago or something like that. We went all out, because he's, he's, he's important. I mean, everybody's important. We went all out. He was released within 24 hours. I'm not saying that it was because of us, but, but we cover it very closely. Okay. <laughs> And then the, the question about, uh, and before, before I turn to the, the repression all question, all I just want to say, how, first of all, how incredibly inspiring it was last night for us to be around the table with, uh, the, with the activists you brought over here, what, what incredible stories they had, and how it's just, it just amazing to have the opportunity to interact with them, and also how incredibly inspiring both presentations were. It really was just fascinating to see you folks on the ground, what you're doing, the change you're bringing, how you're, you're increasing, uh, you're really helping to build civil society in a, in a place that has been so grossly dysfunctional. It, really is extraordinary. Thank you. If repression increases, uh, is, what, is there a game plan in place? So, t totally. Um, let me, let me, you know, a lot of people, let me answer it in this way. A lot of people are, are asked, sometimes people ask you, what do you do when Fidel dies? You know? No. The big issue here is when somebody gets arrested. That's, that's Fidel's death. So we go at it and we cover it. I, you know, we, we increase power on our radio. Um, we just cover it wall to wall. I don't know how to better explain that. We really go at it. And they know, they notice. Yoani Sanchez has a very um, good anecdote. Back in when she first started tweeting, um, she got arrested with a friend. And they put her in the back of the car. And this intelligence officer had, a, had her knee on, on her back. And she said with her cell phone, because they have the cell phone ready, she sent a tweet. I got arrested. We got it here. And we reported it. On the radio, on the police radio, what the, what the one cop told the other, they already know. It's on the Martis. So we're on it. And they know it. They know it. Sometimes we forget about these things, that we're a focus of the Cuban government, but we are. So, OK? Um, so I was having a good time, and I forgot where I'm at. OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one of the good. Um, <laughs> One of, the, one, of the, one of the things that have occurred lately in Cuba is, is Telesur. I was talking about Telesur. Telesur is, is a network that's focused in Latin America, financed by the, Cuba, by the Venezuelan government. I was going to say the Cuban government. It's about the same thing nowadays. Um, so the interesting thing about Telesur is they do have an editorial line that they say their north is to the south. They hardly ever talk about the United States, only to bad things about the United States, right? But Telesur is more, has more information that the Cuban media provides. It's more, I don't want to say flexible, but for example, I was walking down the hall one day, and Humberto pulls me aside and says, you know what Telesur is doing right now? 
They're telling people how to search in Google. They're tell, you know, so I'm like, this is beautiful. This is where we need to be, right? They don't have the editorial um, lines that we have, of course, or guidelines. Um, some people, so, so I think that's part, that's been part of our impact, right? That Telesur is out there. Um, it's not what we want, for sure. It's not what we want, but it's part of, of our job. I'm not saying it's all attributed to us. I'm not saying that by any shape or form, but it's, it's, it's certainly something that, you know, we have created some of that change or caused some of that change. Um, the last three things I want to talk about influencing government is the admission by government hierarchy that they can no longer control the introduction of DVDs and flash drives on the island. And my friends, that has radio and TV MRT all over it, all over it. Um, and I still get goosebumps every time I talk about that because we started this humble project doing 100 DVDs a, a week. Same thing with the um, text messages. I still remember the first time we sent a text message to Cuba, Skype, four text messages. We were jumping up and down. Oh my God, it works. Uh, it was great. Today, we are, our goal is to send more than 5,000 DVDs per week to the island. And you saw that beautiful map that we have there. I saw some of the governors yesterday, Mr. Chairman. You weren't, allowed, weren't able to be here. But that's all being created by the people here in, at the Martis. Less expensive than the airplane, far more effective. And the last but not least, the one's very close to my heart. When I first took this job, I wanted to make sure that the Martis were an asset to the United States. I think it was very important that we became an asset to the United States because we are paid by United States taxpayers. This is not only a Miami thing. We have great Miami support, and I love them to death, and I want them to keep supporting us, believe me. Um, but we have to become an asset to the United States, to United States foreign policy. So we took the task of reaching out to different agencies or branches of the government. We have, I'm very proud to say, we have a great relationship with state, great relationship with DOD. Is Juan Hurtado here today? He's not? Juan Hurtado, we have a great relationship with the White House. And thanks to Susie's coordination and willing to go to meet with Congress and face the music, we have a lot of credibility in Congress today. And Susie called me the other day and she told me, Carlos, you're one of my talking points. OCB is one of my talking points. I was like, <laughs> let her rip. That's great. So I think that's great value that we're bringing to the BBG. So it expands from the impact model, right? Um, so I'll finish with this. Two weeks ago, the director of this institution, and it has nothing to do about me, I want to make that very clear, had a meeting with probably one of the most powerful women in Congress. And it all played out perfect, because I was there by myself, Governor Armstrong was late, Susie Carroll were late, because they were tied up with the senator, and I was doing my speech, right? I was, I was, I was going at it. I had her right in front of me, Great lady, great woman, but she was looking at me. I'm like, I don't know if this lady's getting this, but I'm, you know, I'm just letting it happen. Um, so when I'm done, she looks at me, and she points and says, this is the best meeting. And this, the, the, the presentation was about the Martis, obviously. It wasn't about anything else. She looks at me, and she says, this is the best meeting I've had in a very long time. That made my year, and I walk away with that. So thank you so much for being here. Um, if you have any questions... Happy to answer them. And uh, yes. I thought 3 million uh, viewers, I think, monthly viewers or something like that. Like no, those are unique visitors to the website. To the website. And it's, a, it's not uh, monthly. Okay. No, no, that's why uh, I can no, really quickly on this. So that, that map was showing a trend of the growth from the last couple of years to this year. So at this far of the year, five months, we are at above 1.5 million visitors. Last year we got uh, a little bit shy of three million i'm hoping that we we're going to reach cross more than that in visits to the website and is there a way to know like the ratings from from the radio and the tv 
station. Yeah. That's why we exist. Because you cannot go to a, with a paper clip in Cuba and find out whether they're watching us or not, mm -hmm. right? That's the reason why we exist. But I'll tell you this, this is the best way to answer it. When we do a giveaway here, the Cuban government knows about it. They know, believe me. When we give out mopeds, uh, charge cell phones, whatever, they know. The amount of participation that we get from all over the island, guarantee they're listening, for sure. Talk There's about no that. Talk about the numbers of participation for a second. Okay, so let me give you an example. I was here a year and a half or something like that. We had changed the content. And I was like, okay, so I'm walking down the hallways and I'm like, I'm listening to these people calling from Cuba, but how, how, how strong is our punch, right? Um, so we came up with this idea of giving away six mopeds. On January 6th, are you familiar with the Epiphany Day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which they don't celebrate in Cuba, yeah, right? Okay, so January 6th, we said, let's give, away, let's give away six mopeds. By the way, we did not use U.S. taxpayers' money. It was a gift from donors before we, before, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me make very clear about that. So we promoted that giveaway for a week and a half. We had over more than 3,000 participants in a week and a half from Cuba. Text message, calls, I mean, the phones were going off the hook. But here's the cool part. By January 5th, you had to put in your solicitation or your application, right? You cannot participate on January 6th. But we promoted the show that was going to, actually, Revoltillo, was going to be for an hour and a half. I'm sorry, what's your name again? Nora Gámez. Nora. The phone was ringing off the hook in the studio. Actually, Karen Caballero, who's here, was anchoring it. And people were asking, do you speak Spanish? Yeah. People were asking her, Oye, Karen, ¿cuándo es el próximo sorteo? The entire island was calling. It was amazing. Actually, Channel 51 was there. And the camera guy was like, this is incredible. So we, we have a punch. Uh, just uh, uh, another small question. Can you talk about uh, how these DVDs are distributed? You, you talk about distribution centers. And who's getting these 5,000 uh, DVDs per week? The DVDs are being distributed through legal means. I'm sure you live here in Miami. Um, so if you walk through or drive through Calle Ocho, or not far from here, there's a lot of people that send packages to Cuba. We are the United States government. We do things the right way. We go, we pay, and they ship them. Excellent. But in Cuba, who, how are they distributed? Activists, um, church, churches, um, you know, regular citizens. Are you familiar with, the, with the DVD banks in Cuba? Yes. We try to insert ourselves into those. It's for free, but you know we, that's that's how we do it. We download. Some of them are being downloaded in the distribution centers that we talked about. Mm -hmm. Some of the content is being downloaded. So we have 85. To, to that we have 85 right. distribution centers in the island. We have copy centers, so we distribute to so, some houses and our activists that are volunteers come pick them up and they dub them. They distribute it across the island. Okay. And we have more than 100 churches of different denominations helping mm -hmm. us make these distributions. So a lot of members of the civil society. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Any more questions? An hour and a half and no Yasiel Puig mentioned. <laughs> I, I got a picture here. I got, he's jealous because I have a picture of Yasiel Puig right next to me. <laughs> no, yeah, any Yasiel Puig? No, anybody, any other questions from anybody? This is a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, th panel, I think huh? uh, one, one thing I'd like to point out that Nora's question really highlights the problem with all of our services around the world in the sense that we are broadcasting, communicating with people in places where the government doesn't want us to communicate and therefore we don't have really the ability to go out and, and get ratings or get any kind of thing. We have to have other means. So, so this, the, one of, you know, in, my, in my television business in the private sector, you broadcast and you know what's working and then you change your broadcasting and it's all very easy actually in retrospect. But my colleagues don't like hearing that. But <laughs> um, here we actually have to not only put together great content like you showed us today, but we have to use all sorts of forms of distribution uh, to get it to people against the will of their government. And then we somehow have to figure out whether it's being, having an impact and then change it appropriately. So I, Hey, you know, I, I know all of our services are here to spend every day on that. I want to commend them and also you guys. I think it's a, a very inspiring, kind of wonderful presentation. And hats off to the, the whole team here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Any other Appreciate the time. The or, nope. Okay, we're going to do one more transition to the panel.
that we talked about. I think we're going to take a short break. Let's make the break 10 minutes. Okay. And then we'll be back here in 10 minutes for the next panel. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good job. Great job. Thank you.